reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. We're going to read from chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethany and Bethphage at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks why you're untying it, just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it just as Jesus had said. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on it, they set Jesus upon it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen. They said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. Jesus answered them, I tell you, even if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If even you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and will surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children with you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh.
This is the fourth Sunday of our online worship services. It's been two weeks since Governor Murphy issued his stay-at-home order, and I think most of us are starting to settle into a new rhythm. Our lives look markedly different than they did a month before, but at least for me and our family, it feels like day-to-day -day life has a bit more of a routine established than it did when this pandemic first began. And while we're all doing our best to adjust to this new normal, one thing that remains difficult for almost all of us to process is this underlying feeling of anxiety. It might not be at the forefront, but it's always there, beating away in the background. We're all anxious about something. Will I need to lay people off? Am I going to be laid off? How will I find a job in this market? Are my savings going to last through retirement? What if my parents get sick? What if I get sick? What's going to happen next? We all have really good reasons to worry right now. And in the midst of this global pandemic, we've arrived at the beginning of Holy Week. On this Palm Sunday, we hear the citizens of Jerusalem greeting Jesus with loud cheers and a plea for peace. They cry out to Jesus, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. This deep longing for peace is something I think that we can all relate to today. In Israel, the people were weary of Roman occupation. The peace they wanted was freedom from foreign rule. On a large scale, the Pax Romana was a monumental achievement, but for the local people living in Israel, it brought them little more than a heavy tax burden and brutal reprisal any time their citizens stepped out of line. The Jewish tradition had a rich history of prophecy that told of a coming Messiah, a Prince of Peace. And those seeing Jesus ride into Jerusalem on a donkey that day would have remembered the words of the prophet Zechariah well. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey. The scene in this morning's reading contrasts clearly with the begrudging welcome that Pilate would have received. Pilate was coming down from his palace in Caesarea Philippi, as he did every Passover, to personally oversee the Roman soldiers. Pilate was coming in to keep the peace. He knew that most Jews in Israel were unhappy with the Roman occupation of their country, and historical records from the first and second centuries tell us about several violent rebellions that were brutally crushed by the Roman Empire. In Jesus' day, there was fear of a similar clash between Jewish patriots and Roman guards. So in this tense atmosphere, as Jews from across the occupied territory gathered in Jerusalem, revolution was in the air. As Jesus approaches the city, we read the whole multitude of disciples began to praise him and to hail him as their king. Their chorus here, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven, actually echoes the song of the angels at the beginning of Luke's gospel. The angels sang about peace on earth as Jesus was born. And here at the end of his life, the people sing about peace in heaven. Luke's poetic framing of Jesus' life reminds us that his ministry is one that unites the peace of heaven and the peace of earth. Now, Luke's gospel is less politically provocative than Mark's or Matthew's. You'll notice, for instance, there are no palm leaves and no cries of Hosanna in the story I just read. And that's because those were both seen as symbols of nationalism and opposition to Roman rule. But despite Luke's attempts to remove the political potency of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, 
with this chanting crowd, we still get a pretty clear contrast between the peace of Rome and the peace of God. The crowd is crying out for help. They want a miracle. They want God to do something big. And as all of this is going on, the Pharisees come to Jesus and ask him to silence the crowds. And despite their frequent conflicts with Jesus throughout the Gospels here, I think the Pharisees are actually trying to help. They're trying to avoid a confrontation with Pilate and his soldiers. In their own way, the Pharisees are trying to keep the peace. But Jesus responds to their plea, saying, I tell you, if they were silent, even the stones themselves would shout out. The truth of Jesus' identity and the new peace that God is bringing into the world through him cannot be hidden any longer. Everyone in this story is expecting something to happen. Everyone in this story is pleading for peace. But for each group, what that peace looks like and the best way to achieve it is remarkably different. And as Jesus looks out across the Kidron Valley, he sees the city where he's going to die, and he weeps. He pauses and says, if only you had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now, they're hidden from your eyes. Here again, Jesus reminds us that in God's kingdom, our expectations and assumptions are often challenged. Finding peace is not easy. And sometimes the only way to achieve it is through confrontation. What does that mean for us today when peace is even more elusive than ever? Usually we try to find peace by escaping from the things that are troubling us. Maybe we'll go on a vacation or maybe we'll go to the Y and take a yoga class. Maybe you come to church on a Sunday morning and pray. But we can't do any of that right now. If you think back on the times that you could, though, I imagine you'll remember that whenever you got back from your vacation, whenever you got home from the Y, maybe even after you got home from church, your problems and your worries were still there waiting for you. Sometimes the only way through our fear and our anxiety is to confront it head on. That's what we see Jesus doing in this morning's reading from Luke. And I think that's also our calling as Christians. And that's why being part of a church community is so essential. We are here precisely for moments like this. We are here to support each other and to lift each other up when life happens, standing side by side. And we do this because we worship a God that does the same. One of my favorite saints is Julian of Norwich. She's a woman who lived in 14th century England. And when she was young, in her 30s, she fell seriously ill. She was bedridden, and her family actually thought that she was going to die. And while she was lying on what she thought was her deathbed, Julian had a series of visions. She saw Christ appear in front of her with the wounds of the crucifixion, and he spoke to her. And Julian was so profoundly moved by what she saw in those visions that she wrote them down immediately. Eventually, Julian recovered from her illness and lived to be 71 years old. And she spent the rest of her life reflecting on and processing what had happened to her and what she had seen in those visions. And in the second half of her life, she published an expanded version of those visions, offering her insight and interpretation to them. At one point when she was laying in her deathbed, Julian asked God, where is the hope and peace in our particular trials? Where is the hope and peace in the trials that entangle the world? And God appeared to her and said, it is said that sin is the cause of this pain, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. All shall be well. God didn't appear to Julian and offer her a particular explanation or reason why this had happened to her. But God did assure her that she was not alone in her suffering and that pain and fear would not have the final word. 
That's a powerful message for us today. While time may reveal many more details about the origin and spread of the coronavirus, we will never be able to answer the question, why did this happen? In our own search for peace in the midst of suffering, our response cannot be to run away from or around our fears and anxieties. Like Julian and her illness, and like Jesus riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, we must confront these questions head on. One way we can do this is by naming and sharing them. Earlier this week, our church came together with Christ the King for an online prayer service, and it went really well. We had nearly 100 people on the Zoom call. There were some really funny moments when people forgot their microphones were live and started talking to other people in the room with them. But there were also some really profound moments. And one that stood out to me was when we had a time of silence and we asked people to share what was on their heart, a prayer request for a person, a place, or a situation that they were worried about. And people were really honest in this sharing even our frozen chosen Presbyterians were in there offering spontaneous prayers for the people, the places, and the situations that they cared about. The sharing went on a lot longer than I expected it to, and that was a welcome surprise. And for me, these prayers were a big step forward on our collective journey through this anxiety, fear, and grief that we're carrying together. And this is what Palm Sunday is all about. As we look ahead to Easter, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know how that story ends. And most years, it's tempting to rush ahead, to jump from the hosannas of Palm Sunday straight in to the hallelujahs of Easter. But this year, we're invited to do something else. This year, we're invited to slow down and think about what's really going on here. Jesus was not riding into Jerusalem to have a good time. He was not looking forward to a week away from his worries and the people that were bothering him. Jesus was riding into Jerusalem to die, to confront the people and the institutions that were working against that peace he was trying so hard to establish. The people lining the streets that day each came to Jesus with their own hopes and their fears. And as they laid their palms at Jesus' feet, they laid those hopes and fears with them, asking Jesus to carry them forward. And I'd like to invite us to do that this morning. What hope or what fear are you carrying with you? If you were in the crowd that day, what would you be laying at Jesus' feet? I want you to take just a minute and reflect on that right now. You could write down or hold in your mind a sentence or even a few words that describe a person, a place, or a situation that's on your heart. In this silence, let's share all of those with God, lifting them up. Remembering that God came to live among us, to share our burdens, to live our life, so that one day we might all experience In the silence, let's offer all of these up to God. Remembering that God came to live among us, for a moment just like this, to live our life, to share our hopes, and to carry our burdens, so that one day we might all find a lasting peace, a peace in which all will be well, and all will be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you please join me in prayer?
generous God, even in this season of hardship, we are aware of the blessings we enjoy as members of your family. Today, as we hear again the story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, we remember especially how you came to keep vigil with us, to walk alongside us, and to suffer with us. May all that we offer to you and all that we are be your means of grace in the world, that all people may encounter your love and experience your peace. As we mark the beginning of Holy Week, we thank you for the stories and lessons that each day brings. Stories about your passion for justice and your heart for the poor. Lessons about what matters most and the danger of going along with the crowd. As we journey together towards Easter, help us to pause. Help us to pay close attention to what we see and hear. And in doing so, to grow in our understanding and in our faith. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, especially for those who have not been able to say goodbye. We pray in sadness at their loss and in hope for their future. We pray for those who are ill and the many who risk their lives and their own health to treat them from our own volunteer fire and first aid squads, to the doctors and nurses working in hospitals around the world. In the midst of chaos, anxiety, and doubt, we pray that they would feel supported and respected, and we pray for comfort and healing in you, Lord. We pray for the many people around the world today who struggle to find food and shelter, remembering that there are many people even here in Morris County for whom food and a warm bed are not guaranteed. Lord, help us all work hard to bring an end to poverty so that homelessness and hunger become things of the past. We pray for those who are suffering violence, victims of domestic abuse trapped at home. We pray for those who cannot control their anger or fear, and lash out at those around them. And we pray for those around our globe living in war zones, whose daily routine has changed, but whose daily fear of attack or bombing has not diminished. In all of these places, in all of these homes, we pray for peace to come quickly. And Lord, we pray for our church family. Bless them and bless those who we name now in the silence. Hear these our prayers, Lord, and hear us as we join our voices with the chorus of the faithful throughout the world who pray using the words that your Son, our Savior, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I continue to hold all of you in my prayers, and I look forward to the day when we can celebrate in person together once again. May God be with you, and may God bless you. Goodbye.